But Sherlock Holmes survived when, by popular demand, Conan Doyle revived him in later years. No other fictional character can command his following, which still brings thousands of tourists each year to look at his study, recreated above his own London pub. Ah, oh, come in, Geoffrey. Do sit down. Well, Tony, you're the chairman of the Sherlock Holmes Society, and we're sitting here in a recreation of the great man's study. Tell us, what's the fascination for you all of Sherlock Holmes? For myself, I tend to think it's the boy in every man. I mean, Doyle expressed it himself rather nicely in a little bit of jingoistic verse he wrote, when he said, I have wrought my simple plan if I give one hour of joy to the boy who is half a man, to the man who is half a boy. That expresses it pretty well for me, I think. Now, what sort of a man was Doyle? A very large man, about six foot four. He was known, the French called him the gentle giant. And, uh, in fact, in his own character, he had this strange mixture of both Holmes and Watson. He looked the, the perfect Watson, but he could throw his mind artificially into this acute reasoning machine that was Sherlock Holmes. Things that are nowadays taken for granted, um, uh, plaster casts, examination of dust through microscopes, uh, all this was terribly new at, at the day. I mean, Doyle was the pioneer of this. It, it was crime detection up to date. I mean, one thinks of Sherlock Holmes as, as a man dressed in a deerstalker hat with an Inverness cape, um, smoking a large curling pipe. Uh, and saying, elementary, my dear Watson. Now, n strictly according to the stories, none of those is correct. The, uh, some of them have rather strange explanations. The curling pipe, for instance. Now, William Gillette, who was one of the early actors, found that if he had a straight pipe, which, which he did, and he put it in his mouth, he couldn't speak the lines without the pipe wobbling. <laughs> so, in fact, but he found he, if he had one like this, uh, it worked splendidly. Then, of course, it became caricatured, and you ended up with the popular meerschaum, but it's strictly wrong. The Inverness cape and the deerstalker hat came from the illustrations uh, of, by Sidney Paget in the Strand magazine. And the elementary, my dear Watson, well, Holmes said elementary, he said, my dear Watson, but never once did he say them together. Again, that comes from William Gillette, the actor. I gather you're involved in setting up yet another museum devoted to Holmesy armour. That's going to be, we hope, the really definitive one in Switzerland. This is at Meiringen, where Holmes and Moriarty had their fatal encounter, and they were both believed to have died. It was on their way to the museum that we discovered members of the Sherlock Holmes Society taking tea at the Grand Hotel Victoria Interlaken. Suitably attired, they were on a pilgrimage to the Swiss locations of a story called The Final Problem. And they were donating an extraordinary variety of memorabilia to get the museum started. Uh, I understand uh, that uh, a museum is being opened in my memory uh, in Meiringen, and I think it's a, a very suitable honour, quite frankly. Uh, this is a, a signed programme of a silent movie film uh, starring Isla Norwood, made in the 20s. Uh, one of the longer stories, The Sign of Four. And uh, it is uh, interesting, obviously, that it is signed. We brought along a Garnier plate, which it is believed was in a pillar box, which stood at the junction of Blandford Street and Baker Street in London from 1865 to 1966. Sherlock Holmes always kept his tobacco in the toe end of a Persian slipper, attached to the side of the, of the fireplace, above the coal scuttle in which he kept his cigars. He kept his cigars in the coal scuttle, his tobacco in the toe end of a Persian slipper. Somehow, Meiringen is not quite the typical Swiss village. Sherlock Holmes is a part of this village's heritage, and the Swiss have always welcomed the often eccentric British. But this centenary year is special, and it's attracted members from all over the world. When we heard this was coming off, we said, we will mortgage the dog if we have to. We are going. 
Of course, these people are not any crowd of Victorians. Each one is a character from a Sherlock Holmes story. But I take the part of John Douglas in the Valley of Fear. I always have a wedding ring, which is, which is on the little finger of the left hand. And of course, to gain entry into the Scourers, uh, I was branded. And so that you may be sure of that, there is my brand mark, a circle with a triangle therein. Yeah. Looking forward to meeting old Steiner again. Mm, yes. I have on two previous occasions played Sherlock Holmes, and that was great fun, but I'm now too old and much too fat. I think, I think now I would much prefer to be the Napoleon of crime, Professor Moriarty. It's much more fun playing a villain, you know. Let us test your powers of observation. Of course, of course. Who do you see on this, this boat? Just an ordinary crowd of trippers, Holmes. Nothing unusual, I don't think. Just an ordinary crowd. This is your problem, my dear Watson. You see, but you do not observe. I will explain. Over there, for example, you have Holy Peters, one of the most infamous criminals Australia has ever produced. Good Lord. His speciality? is beguiling lonely young ladies, playing upon their religious sensibilities. Over there we have Baron Adelbert Brunner, utterly ruthless. Heavens, Holmes. He arranged a fatal accident for his first wife at the Schlugen Pass. Can we not have the fellow arrested on the spot? Ah, no, my dear fellow. He got away on a technicality. Of course, Holmes, of course. Good God, my dear fellow. And there is Moriarty. Moriarty? Indeed, the evil Napoleon of crime. The greatest criminal mind the world has ever known. Well, I suppose with so many villains on a relatively small boat, something was bound to happen. We, we've just had, had a very sudden death on board. Cardinal Tosca, who's a, an eminent uh, member of the Roman Catholic clergy, has died suddenly. It is a matter of great personal sadness for me to preside over the committal of his saintly body. The word has got to his holiness already because a Vatican uh, telegram has arrived asking Sherlock Holmes to investigate the cause of the death. To the bottom of the lake which he loved so well. Officers, do your duty. The highlight of the trip was a symbolic reenactment of the death of Mr. Holmes and Professor Moriarty at the Reichenbach Falls. Holmes had walked, but the members took the new funicular. The funicular railway also brought the world's press. The leading politicians could scarcely attract this interest. A dozen television news crews, the Geneva Arms Talks yesterday, Sherlock Holmes today, two crews alone from Japan. Right, you haven't got it now, it's too late. The sorrow was genuine, and so were the police. For Holmes, touches a spot in many a detective inspector's heart. If only Watson had not left his friend's side. Too late, Dr. Watson. I'm afraid so. Too late. There were few who didn't mourn the loss of their hero in their own way. In a strange world where fact and fiction were inextricably mixed, and the past was very much alive. He is a man admired by all. I refer, of course, to the late, great, Professor James Moriarty! I'm Dr. Watson. 
Sherlock Holmes's biographer and greatest friend. This is an outrage, a gross perversion of the truth. Misunderstood genius. Oh. I've been to this place once before. I've read about it. I love Watson's word pictures of it. And I arrived feeling excited and thrilled at being here. You lay a reef on the memorial to the greatest man who never lived, and you find yourself blinking back the tears. The immortal Sherlock Holmes. No doubt he'll be back in another hundred years when Holmesian memorabilia will be even more valuable.